Hello, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm very excited to chat with you all about my favorite subject, personalized learning. Um, we're going to give folks a couple seconds to, uh, to join us today, but we do have a lot to cover, so I'm anxious to get started. Um, while folks are rolling in, I would love to uh, open up the chat feature to an icebreaker. Um, so we're talking about personalized learning today in the realm of early literacy, but of course we know that personalized um, learning or care or services uh, are available in many other industries and products. And so I'm curious if you can think of a uh, product or service or software that you use that, that really personalizes the experience to your needs. And if you are feeling so inclined, uh, if you would write in the chat, what is that, that product or service? How do they personalize it, the experience for you? And how does that experience make you feel overall? And we'll give folks um, a minute or two to jot down some initial thoughts, if you wouldn't mind, and then I will uh, get started. So this could be a um, something you use outside of the classroom to help maintain your household. It could be something you use for fun. Just anything you can think of that is um, is personalized to you. And we'll give just a couple more seconds before I reveal my favorite and see if it resonates with you all. Thank you, Daniel. Instagram, TikTok, Facebook. Readworks, oh cool. Oh nice, so Readworks, they provide articles specifically for the, the subgroups that you work with. Awesome, thank you. Leah, Amazon Prime sends you recommended deals based on past purchases, so it gets to know you. Customer service is good. Oh, that's great. Thank you, uh, thank you all for, for sharing those. I will go ahead and share mine, somewhat similar um, to some of you, but I don't know if you've heard of this uh, company. Um, thank you, Stacey. Uh, Imperfect Foods, it is essentially a grocery delivery service, but they partner with uh, local and organic farms who, I don't know if you know this, but there's a high level of rigor or perfectionism that, that happens when our, our chains are buying groceries or uh, produce from farms. And so a lot of food actually gets wasted. So Imperfect Foods will take some of those food items that maybe are too big or too small or have slight blemishes and package them up for people like me. So I feel like I'm making an impact. Uh, I took an initial quiz. They got to know me, they know I'm a vegetarian, they know that I don't like mushrooms. And as I continue to personalize the things that I want to buy every every uh, two weeks, they make recommendations. And so I really like that experience. And it sounds like um, I was thinking about what are some common themes in these personalized services or products. They kind of align to what you all said too. So, so hopefully this resonates. But when we think about a personalized product or service, this is something that gets to know you and it adapts as your needs change. So it has kind of a growing understanding of who you are. Uh, as a result, it's saving your time, expanding your horizon. So it's giving you a lot of additional value and time back. And then ultimately, um, Leah said it, uh, it makes you feel valued. You feel good, happy. It makes me want to tell other people about the service that I'm using because it has made me feel really positive. So thanks for, for engaging in that icebreaker with me, but let's bring it now back to, um, to education. So when we think about personalized instruction from a teacher's perspective, so, so all the amazing work that you all do, um, what does that look like? And it, it turns out to be quite similar in my opinion. So you get to know the student, this could be based on your assessments, your interactions with the students, um, you hear their favorite TV show and know that, oh, that child's really going to love when we get into a unit about monkeys. Um, you know, all these things that help you from an initial standpoint get to know who they are and what they need. 
If you are a science of reading teacher, you know all about this uh, depiction of a simple view of reading and know that there is a lot of, uh, a lot of work going on to, to teaching literacy, but that it's actually pretty systematic and explicit if you know how to, um, how to work the system. And so you're following the science, you know the student. And then of course, while there is a system, there is also opportunities to adapt that system to your students' needs. So of course, if they're struggling with a certain letter sound, you're uh, in the core instruction, you might take them aside in differentiated learning time and, and do some additional practice with them before they go back into the core and move on to the next lesson. Um, so similarly, it's all about really uh, getting to know a person and their needs and adapting um, when those needs change. And so then thinking about personalized instruction within a program, um, ideally it's doing the same thing. A really great science of reading batch literacy program will do exactly, um, not as well as you, but, but the same types of things to provide the best possible instruction for your students. And if it is doing all of these things, what it ultimately allows you to do is have more time to engage with your students and do the, the work that only you can do with the students that only you can know as well as you do. And of course, then it's going to extend your reach um, to, to work with more students and be more targeted in your instruction because you're getting these extra data points. You are getting more insights into where students are having to adapt their path. Um, and so this is all really in service to you in orchestrating your classroom and your students. And so it does fit into this larger picture of an early literacy solution that's based on the science of reading. Um, and you know, we typically think of science of reading when we think about our core instruction, of course, um, our, our uh, screeners and our small groups. And then personalized learning is sometimes where we think um, uh, we don't put as much attention into the science of reading within those those opportunities where students are working independently. And so that's why it's really important to me and I'm glad that you all are here to learn more about how to look out for um, a really great science of reading and learning based personalized learning program. What are the things you should be looking for and what are some of the common themes that we see science of reading or not. Um, so our goals for today uh, are to learn about these key elements of a personalized learning program and then be able to navigate if it's based on the science of reading or not know what to look for if you are in, in a phase where you are reevaluating your existing solutions or you are looking for new ones, um, make sure that you have the, the kind of checklist, the tools you need to look really critically at these solutions. And then I am here to answer any questions you have, which reminds me of a couple other housekeeping things. So if you have any questions, uh, please enter them into the Q&A or the chat. I have some friends on the line you can answer if I can't in real time. Uh, we'll have time at the end to, to dive into questions as well, but uh, feel free to, to uh, type them up as we go along. We, will be re we are recording this session, so you will be receiving it within 24 hours. If you are interested in using closed captions, you can turn those on. There should be uh, a button at the bottom of your screen to have that uh, for you. Um, and with that, I think we're going to, to kick off. So, you don't have to write this down because again, you'll get this recording and a really great ebook that tells a, a, a similar story. But there are five key elements that all personalized learning solutions have that they have different approaches to. The first one is the research base and the, the degree to which it aligns with the core, your core instruction. The second is how does a program place students into the scope and sequence? And, um, and where does it focus the students, uh, you know, the, the instruction that they should be focusing on first? Uh, is it across all content areas just on one? How do students move through that scope and sequence? Is it static? Is it adaptive? What is your role as the teacher in implementing the program with fidelity? And then how does the program approach student motivation? So we're going to break down each of these um, and, uh, and think about what questions we should be asking ourselves and the programs that we work with. 
So for the first one, you really want to look for a program that complements your science of reading instructional practices. Of course, it is so important that all of these elements of your literacy solution are rowing in the same direction or reinforcing one another because we, we um, have lots of work to do and, and time is, is really valuable. So questions to ask as you're thinking about evaluating your programs, um, is, is your, your personalized learning solution actually supporting and strengthening your core? Or is it just something to keep students busy and it's really kind of disconnected? Is it um, aligned to the types of effective, effective scaffolds that you're using, especially in foundational skills? Is it leveraging the latest uh, research and comprehension and vocabulary uh, within the system? Is it using that approach for all students? Um, or does it wait for later grades to introduce comprehension and vocabulary? You really want to make sure that that base of content and research is aligned to what you are doing in the classroom and what your other programs are, are helping you do. So uh, two approaches. Uh, one approach that you want to look out for as something you do not want is a disconnected approach to instruction. So this disconnect can come in a number of ways based on what your approach is, uh, but this often comes in terms of um, instructional focus, maybe the skill coverage itself is not what you're focusing on, maybe the instruction is not as nuanced and scaffolded as yours is, maybe it's um, not as differentiated, maybe the scope and sequence is pretty linear, and it's not giving students that adaptive support. There are a lot of red flags that you really want to look into and ask these questions um, when you are, are evaluating programs like this, because there's a lot of time that students are on these programs without you, uh, and you want to make sure that that um, it's it's all in service to your students and the work that you're doing. So ideally, uh, the program is using a research based pedagogy that is aligned to your instruction. It's doing all the differentiation that you would do just in this in this digital form. It's giving students exposure to phonics and comprehension and vocabulary, all relevant to their grade and skill level. So making sure that students are able to get the support they need and move forward at the same time. So similarly, uh, uh, the next element is looking for a program that uses a whole child approach. This is super important now, especially. So um, we, we wanna think about instructional focus. Is a program putting uh, the child on their weakest area or are they building on strengths? Um, how is it determining where students need to be working and, and when and at what level? And are students um, just focusing on one skill area before they move on to another, or are they able to work across all these different strands of, um, of the, the scars, girls rope that we know are really important. So uh, what we see a lot of times out there is a deficit-based approach. So um, in this case, a lot of programs will have an initial screener that is really just trying to find out a student's weakest area. That's why they say they have an adaptive, adaptive diagnostic. So it's, they're, they're saying it's, it's faster to get to student information, but really it's faster to get to that weakest area. It's not always looking comprehensively across the other skill areas that it should. And then what it does with that information is it puts students into practice in that lowest grade area and content area. So for example, if a, a student, um, if their lowest score in this pathway was phonics, they are going to be focused on that area until they're ready to move on to their next weakest area. Or um, I've seen other programs that um, will let students work across skill areas, but they're going to level all of them down to that weakest area. So in this case, the student um, was screened as on grade level for vocabulary, but in a program like that, they would be working below grade level in vocabulary to align with that weakest phonics instruction. So they're actually being held back in areas where they are so ready to move forward and that we know they, they should be. So what you really wanna look for is a whole child approach, putting students in the instructional areas that they need at their grade level and making sure that they are working on these in tandem. Um, you know, we, we know how important that is, but just to, to give some examples, if a student is below grade level in phonics, but they're learning different vocabulary words and they're hearing these sounds, they're seeing those letters, they're seeing them in, in text that they're reading when they're doing comprehension work, all of these things really work together to give students that support in, in their below grade level phonics area. So it's really, it's really 
really a deficit when you're putting students just in that skill area because it's ignoring the fact that all of them really round out um, our instruction and what we know works for students. So next we wanna look for a program that has an adaptive scope and sequence. This one is really, really important because it's one of the things we hear about personalized learning programs all the time is it's adaptive. But I really want you to scrutinize um, what, is, what does adaptive mean in the program that you're using or are looking at? Because it means different things to different um, providers. Uh, so, and we'll look at two of the examples, but some other questions, um, you know, how unique is the content and the sequencing of content to each student? Is it um, students going through the same content at their own pace, or is it really moving what students see based on their performance? Um, how, how does that shift happen when students are struggling in one area? What kind of support do they get? Um, and how far does that support go? And so what we see in a lot of these programs is uh, a very linear approach to a scope and sequence, uh, meaning that um, Level one is, is these, the certain set of skills in kindergarten that you can be placed into, you work through them step by step, and then when you finish them, you move on to level two. So all of these, it's, it's just one long line of, of skills. It's a checklist and students based on that placement point get plopped in at different points. Um, but the content and the series of the content is the same. And so it's really not adapting to student performance. Um, it is just, it's just kind of adapting at the beginning uh, in terms of placement. What we're really looking for is a program, and this really goes back to the product examples at the beginning. Um, we know that there's not a person looking at my order from Imperfect Foods and, and making recommendations. There's an algorithm that the program is using um, because it's leveraging uh, you know, a lot of the really great things that technology can do and does really well. And so when we think about that in the context of personalized learning, um, there is a lot that that technology should be doing to adapt based on student performance. We place students into one set of skills, but then if they struggle in one area, um, we have to give them support in that area before we have them practice it again. So you can see in this representation of a scope and sequence or what we call a learning map, um, it is anything but linear. You can see how students can move um, up and down all around these different skill areas based on their individual needs and performance. Um, and so that there are, are millions of ways that students can actually move through um, the scope and sequence. And this is exactly what you do in the classroom all the time. You wouldn't just uh, you know, stop instruction when a student struggled until they got it and then moved on. You're doing all of these things. You've built the algorithm. And so you really want a program that is supporting all of that work that you do. So along those lines, you want to look for a program that is, is kind of functioning as a digital tutor. It is doing all the things that you would be doing with the student to the best of its ability based on all this technology, and it's saving your time. So things you want to think about asking is, you know, what does a program do when the students are really struggling with a skill? Um, does it provide one level of scaffolding and then you have to intervene, or does it address that, that problem area in, in subsequent activities and then give students opportunities to practice it again. Um, what is expected of, of you in the program? Are you responsible for instruction, for moving students forward? What's that relationship? Um, and is it actually in the end of the day saving your time or is it demanding your time that could be better spent elsewhere? And so this is really tricky because it is pretty commonplace that the programs that are out there are, are actually requiring too much of your time in unnecessary areas. So we have a lot of programs that when a student struggles in a specific area, it will give that level of scaffolding and that's what they mean by adapting. Um, and then when students don't understand it, they say, oh, domain is shut down, can't do anything else until you, the teacher, intervenes. Um, so that student has nothing else to do on their device. Even if it's good instruction, they can't move forward until you have to interrupt what you're doing, jump in and help that student. And I know that's really hard for a lot of teachers to find the time to notice that there's something that they're supposed to do. And sometimes you just don't have time to do the full 10 minute lesson that the program is asking you to. And you, know, you might hope that the program was going to intervene on its own. And why, why should you have to jump in there when there are other critical areas that you should be working on with your students? 
a program that's going to save your time is really you know thinking about it as as a digital tutor um, a program that is uh, using all of the best practices that you are using it is jumping in and supporting students when they need help by adapting instruction and giving them the individualized pathway, pathways they need to master that challenging content in the same way that you would do. And so you're not interrupted, um, but you are given the insights you need to, to drive your instructional choices, but this is your best friend, maximizing your students' time when they are on a device and giving you that time um, with your individual students uh, at the same time. And then finally, we wanna look for a program that motivates students intrinsically. This is another buzzword we hear all the time in personalized learning, um, that this program is highly engaging for our students. Um, and we kind of take for granted or just don't think about that word anymore because it's become so commonplace. And so we do wanna think about it really critically because it is really important in building a, uh, a student who will go on to be a lifelong um, reader. So things to ask of your program is, um, you know, which aspects of the program were motivated or were designed to motivate students? What is the theory behind the motivation techniques that they're using? What do students say they like about the program? How do how students talk about the program? Um, and is it being updated as students are, are, um, are growing up and, and getting older? And so what we, what we see mostly out there is extrinsic motivational techniques. So you might have programs that have a, a coin system. So students put in X amount of work, um, they do this many minutes or, or get to this level and they get some coins in the game that they can use to go into the shop and buy a hat for their avatar. Um, and, uh, or, or maybe they'll, they'll, they'll get coins to play a game that's completely separated from the learning. So they kind of have this, this unfortunate dynamic where the learning is separated from the fun. You do the learning like it's a chore so you can do something fun and then you have to go back and do some more chores and then and then so you can you can put in that work and have some fun. Um, but that's the opposite of how we want students to think about reading. We want them to experience how fun it is and how it really opens up your world um, to new perspectives, ideas. It's an outlet for you as a writer. It does all of these amazing things um, that if you if you separate those to um, you know the engagement and the and the learning, um, you're really setting students up to a dynamic dichotomy that is not going to be in service of their um, their growing identity as readers. So you really want to look for a program that is focused on intrinsic motivation, things that are embedded in the systems, in the games, the program that is getting them excited about the possibilities of, of reading and what it can do for you. So what you'll hear more in this kind of program is, um, you know, students say it's learning, but it's fun. It's helping me read more fluently. It's not I got more points and I'm enjoying that, or I got to unlock X, Y, and Z. It's, it's almost metacognitive. They're understanding that they're doing these two things at once and they're kind of surprised that, that they're enjoying it. They know they're learning. It's kind of um, confusing at first, but ultimately, um, you know, the confidence and, and is really what students are looking for and what we want to give to them so that they, um, you know, continue to go back and keep pushing themselves as readers. So that was a lot of information in a surprisingly little amount of time, but I'll, I'll um, review the, the kind of top level information that we just shared in terms of the, the elements you wanna be looking for. And again, this is valuable if you are reviewing your existing personalized learning program or evaluating new ones. Um, this is an era where it is even more critical that, that all of our resources for our students, whether we are teaching it to them or they are using it independently, is grounded in the same science of reading instructional practices that you are using and that your systems are using. Uh, we have no time to waste with our students. So um, hopefully you can be really critical when you are evaluating programs and ask and think about the research base, is it is it aligned to yours? Is it aligned to the science of reading or is it um, disconnected and actually kind of, um, you might be getting students one step ahead and it's taking them two steps back. Is it focusing on all areas of a student's abilities or is it focusing just on their weakest area and really keeping them back? 
is the uh, scope and sequence adaptive or is it linear? Is the program adapting to student performance or is it just kind of chugging them along on the same path until they get stuck? And then you have to jump in and spend time teaching a lesson um, that maybe you would have wished the program would have done, or is it conversely, uh, you know, more serving as a digital tutor that is working individually with your students that you can trust because you know that they're based on the same research and instructional practices that you are using? And then is it really helping you build students who are going to um, learn to love reading. That is the end goal of all of the work that we're doing. Um, and so is it is it helping you or is it hurting you? And again, this is all really in service of all the hard work that you have to do. Um, and we want to support you as best we can. So um, on the right, you'll see we have a, an ebook um, that goes into a little bit more detail of some of the content that I shared with you today. We will be sharing it um, either in the chat here or, or afterwards in our follow up with the recording. Um, but I also just wanted to, to share um, uh, my, my favorite program out there, uh, Amplify Reading. You may, may have heard of it if you're in the Amplify family, maybe not. Um, but this is, you know, we built it because we saw that, um, you know, all those non-science of reading approaches were being used in personalized learning. We believe really strongly that students deserve the best everywhere. And so we built this program um, with all these things in mind to make sure that we are engaging students with compelling storylines that are developmentally appropriate and, and also driving them to the skill practice they need, that that skill practice is across um, all of the different skill areas that our K-5 students need. Don, thank you for that question. This is a K-5 program um, so that all kids have access to the foundational skills, vocabulary, comprehension, transferring those skills to actual e-reader text and also embedding the latest instruction in, um, in in all of these areas into what students are doing independently. And we even have teachers who use the program who will peek over their student's shoulder, they're exploring on their own, and they they learn something new because it's, um, it's all based on the science and the science is quickly changing and becoming more um, tangible and so it's it's a really great program for everyone um, and our, our kids and our teachers really like it so we hope that you will check it out um, and ask those same critical questions that we just talked about of this program um, and let me know if you do not find the answers that that we presented but I, I'm sure you will if you are interested in learning more about Amplify Reading, you can go to readingsuccess.amplify.com. That will take you to a landing page um, that will direct you to our K-5 program, which is this one. And then we have a middle school program that is all about close reading. Um, so kind of the, the next step in, in reading comprehension. So we hope that you will check that out. Um, before I, I make a plug for some more science of reading webinars, are there any additional questions um, that uh, that I can help answer for you um, today? I will slowly talk through the next slide in case you are typing. Um, uh, we we want to hear from you, so let us know. Uh, but I will make a plug for some upcoming webinars in our Science of Reading series. We have one coming up in, um, in a couple weeks on how speech recognition can help children learn how to read. So a lot of tools now are being developed to, to help, um, again, give you some of your time back and, and do really cool things with um, recognizing patterns in speech inflection. It helps with our English language learners, a lot of really cool things. So we hope you will join us there. Um, we are also going to delve into the importance of dual language assessment and how to deliver it in your classroom. We know, especially with our, our, um, our English learners and our Spanish speaking ones this past year in COVID have really been hit by, by the lack of instruction that they were able to receive. So this is a really great one, especially if that is a high population in your community. That is on November 6th, uh, 16th. Um, and then we're going to dive into uh, the, the missing link in reading comprehension, which is, um, is all about the, uh, what happens between, or what needs to happen between being able to decode a text so I can literally read the words and being able to understand it. There's a lot that our brain does as fluent readers in that, in that time that um, we don't often teach explicitly to our students. Um, so this is, uh, is done by um, 
one of my colleagues, this is one of the main tenets of Amplify Reading. So your students would be getting that across all grades. Um, so highly recommend that one. Um, and you can register here at amplify.com slash SOR dash fall dash 2021. So we really hope to see you there um, and hope that this was a helpful session for you all. I really um, you know, want to make the most of your time and your resources. And, and it's really important that, that you're all rowing in the same direction. Um, and there, there's no better time than the present. So with that, uh, I will thank you again. These are some of our friends in Amplify Reading, uh, but thank you so much for taking the time today to, to uh, learn about personalized learning and what to look out for. We hope that the recording and especially the ebook, which has even more detail about um, questions to ask, things to look for, to look out for, will be helpful in your journey in, in building the best possible curriculum and supports for your teachers and students this year. So thank you all so much and have a great rest of your Wednesday.